And next up on the stage, um, for those of you that don't know him, I'm sure most of you do, um, we have Todd from, from Token. Um, if you haven't heard Todd speak, you are in for a master class. At Open Banking Excellence, he's spoken, and I'm under pressure to invite him back. Todd is going to be talking about driving the revenue opportunities through open banking, so how maybe through a collaboration in the ecosystem we can all work together, and he will give you a very practical insight into how to make money out of open banking. Todd, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Helen. I always appreciate the kind words. Um, thank you all for your time. Uh, my name is Todd Clyde, CEO of Token, and I'm thrilled to be here to talk about really the roadmap to revenue through open banking. So we want to go through these first technical glitch. Okay, we'll do it manually. Um, this is what we'd like to go through in the next 25 minutes, and so we'll just give a brief introduction about Token. Token's undertaken a lot of primary research of the current state of readiness of banks to comply with PSD2. So I'll share the results of that, uh, that research that we've done. Uh, there are transactions happening through open banking. We'll then look at what are the primary use cases that are driving the volume from both a data and a payments perspective. And then there are barriers. You heard Jamie uh, mention it earlier and, and others. Uh, there are barriers to the mass adoption uh, of access to banks for data and, and, and payments. So what are those barriers? What do we need to see as a fundamental improvements in the ecosystem for this to take off on a, on a massive scale? Um, and then we'll look at how do you make revenue uh, through API-based banking. And we'll look at what I believe is the future for API-based payments as well. Um, so quickly about token. So Token were 50 employees, 25 contractors. We're based in San Francisco, London, and Berlin. And simply put, we make infrastructure software for open banking. And we view open banking as a marketplace. It's a marketplace between banks that have to provide data and consumers or applications that want to consume that data. So therefore, it's a two-sided problem. And we view that the curating the quality of supply of capabilities from banks is as equal as making it easy to consume by third parties. So Token, unlike many other people chasing this open banking market, uh, uniquely focuses on both sides. There's something wrong with my scaling here. Let me try this again. OK, there we go. So we provide software to banks. We provide an API platform that first a bank can use to comply with PSD2. We give them a turnkey compliant API. It's also an API platform that helps them create commercial APIs to launch premium capabilities for which a bank can charge. We also provide software for the third parties. So what you're going to hear throughout this presentation, it is very difficult to connect to every bank across Europe and to apply uh, to that bank to be able to get access to their APIs. Token has done that heavy lifting. We've connected to every bank across Europe, and we give you one API that's very easy to embed into your applications and access data and payments from banks. So basically, we exist to power the next generation of financial applications that all of you are building by putting a bank into every app. So that's a quick introduction of Token. Now let's jump to reviewing our research. I'm going to start with statistics published by the Open Banking Implementation Entity, and then I'll go into our primary research. The UK has led open banking around the world. And uh, if you remember, they, the CMA9 banks, which you've heard about, had a deadline of uh, January of 2018, so almost two years ago. And it's hard to remember back that far, but half the banks missed that deadline, and it took a full nine months for data APIs to stabilize, and a full 15 months for payment APIs to stabilize. But now, there's 46 banks live that are registered. I, you know, guess estimates tell you there's probably about 100 banks live in the UK. There's 165 TPPs, of which only a third are live right now, so there's a lot of pent-up uh, traffic that's coming online. And there's 140 million transactions a month uh, that is now starting in the UK. So if you look at the pace of adoption, when the banks had to be live in January 2018 is not even on this scale. You could see that no significant volume was happening through APIs until about October, a full 10 months later, because it took that long for data APIs to stabilize. Six months after that, payments APIs have stabilized, third parties are coming online, becoming regulated, and you now start to see the usage growing at 35% month over month. 
So I share the UK as an example in that half the banks missed the deadline. It took a while to stabilize. Traffic started slowly and now is taking off. So let's extrapolate that to Europe and let's see what our primary research tells us about. So Europe had two different deadlines. They had a deadline of March to be live in sandbox uh, with documentation and uh, endpoints for APIs. And in September, they had a deadline to be live in production. So how did they do? Um, our research team on March 14th surveyed 1,700 banks uh, across the EU and 92% of them had put up documentation and endpoint to their APIs and indicated the existence of a sandbox. So then we got about the hard work of connecting to each bank, registering with each bank, testing their APIs. And, and the story, these numbers start to degrade. So there was many of these that actually didn't have that because a full six months later, only 88% of the 1,700 banks have accessible APIs, which means you could register as a developer, uh, access, uh, and begin your testing. Okay, only 77% have operational APIs, which means that both the AIS and the PIS functions are operating. And you can see the, the ranking by country there. So that's sandbox. Okay, how about production? So production's been a little bit more difficult to evaluate as well, because many banks do not accept EIDAS certificates, the certificate required by a third party from other countries, which they're supposed to under the regulation. So about two thirds of the banks uh, we've been able to connect to, and uh, this is an extrapolation for the rest. And in production, as of September 14th, only 50% had accessible APIs in production, 30% operational, meaning AIS and PIS, and only 15% were fully compliant. And uh, what does that mean? You can conform to all the items of the RTS and you support the four different or five different payment types uh, that are required. So many people have taken the opportunity to criticize banks and say they haven't conformed, they're late, they're not ready, or to disparage open banking and to say it's not fulfilling on its promises, it's never gonna take off. But my opinion is, why would you have expected anything differently? You know, this is the exact pattern the UK followed. 50% made the deadline. It's gonna take a while for APIs to stabilize. It'll start slowly, and then it's gonna take off and watch out. Um, so UK is open, Europe is opening, Europe is fragmented. Um, of the 2,600 largest banks, this is their breakdown by use of standard. It's a little deceiving. This is about 380 gateways or endpoints, and many gateways have multiple banks behind it, like Spark has an, uh, Volksbank, Commerce Bank, and CBI Globe. Um, you might look at this and think, well, that's pretty good. Three quarters of the banks in Europe follow the next gen standard. But next gen of any standard has the greatest variation or has been implemented with the least consistency. So you've got a lot of variation within uh, those that have followed next gen. Um, interestingly, STET is the most consistently implemented standard, followed that by UK Open Banking. <clears throat> so UK, uh, Europe's fragmented, banks are hard to access. I refer to this as the Russian doll problem. So first you have to become regulated as a third party, and then you have to register with banks and you hit layer after layer after layer after layer of problems. So you have to sign up for the developer portal, which might be online or might take three weeks for them to reply. Then you have to present your certificate, then you have to access Sandbox, and you start testing and help the banks actually debug uh, each of those. Many times we were the first third party that were interacting uh, with, with banks. Um, then you've got to do the whole thing over again in production. So I'm going to refer to this later, but it's, uh, um, Banks are coming online uh, slowly. Uh, it is going to happen. It's a lot of heavy lifting to, to get access to all of them. All right, so let's look at the 140 million transactions that are happening per month. What are the major use cases that are driving that volume? So on the data side, the use case that's driving the greatest traffic is personal financial management or multi-banking. And this is where through one application, you can link all your banking relationships and see balances and transactions, plan a budget, or see your cash flow forecast in one app. The second most frequent use case 
is uh, use for open banking in the risk decisioning process. So this is right when I'm applying for a loan or credit, rather than giving six months of bank statements and my utility statement, I now just onboard or apply by linking my bank. They get access to my information, pull all that forward, and it dramatically shortens the risk decisioning process. So those are the two greatest use cases driving traffic, uh, driving data traffic. Looking at payments, so payments right now is only 0.14% of the total volume, but it's growing rapidly. Um, first biggest use case is topping up of a stored value account, topping up of a mobile wallet. So in the past, the options, if you were a mobile wallet, you had to allow top-ups through credit, debit, Apple Pay, or PayPal, or send them outside to their bank, armed with a sort code and an account number and a reference number, and hope the money makes it in. Now it's really simple to link your banks from within the applications, do a credit transfer to top up uh, the mobile wallet. The second biggest use case is doing a first payment in support of setting up a direct debit or doing a payment in as part of a two leg transaction such as a foreign exchange or an international remittance transaction. So let's look at a few of these actual case studies. So first one, uh, Stu Rents is an example of a first payment. So Stu Rent is a rental website for students where you could locate and contract for rental property. And to accept payment, Stu Rent sets up a direct debit for the second and subsequent payments. Rent is a high transaction value, the first payment they were accepting by credit card. And so now they can simply accept it through a bank transfer which is embedded with the application. So the student stays within their application and they get a cheaper payment. <clears throat> that was an example of a first payment. An example of a payment in is Rewire. Rewire is an international remittance wallet with a corridor between Europe and the Middle East. And same thing, to load the wallet uh, or do that first payment in used to be taken through those expensive mechanisms. They now embed access to all the different bank logos that you could fund from, and it's a simple login and push the payment. Those are two payment examples. Another customer of ours is Cashback. They have a really interesting consumer and SME app, which is called the Slide app, and that does cash flow forecasting for individuals and, and small businesses. And it allows you to link all your banks that analyzes your inflows and outflows and standing orders and direct debits and, uh, and gives you a projected cash flow. So those are three examples of uh, applications that are driving traffic through open banking APIs. So that's the start of it, 140 million transactions. <laughs> what is it gonna take for this to become massively adopted? And there's still some barriers in the ecosystem. And, and I like to refer to these as the four Fs of uh, open banking or the four F words uh, of open banking. And uh, the first one is fragmentation of APIs, uh, then friction in the authentication experience, limited functionality. And I talked about the fourth one already, which is the frustration of a TPP to actually register and connect to uh, each bank. So we're going to look at each one of these problems in a bit more detail. How do we solve them? And then once we could get past them and solve them, uh, how do we generate revenue from open banking use cases? So fragmentation. Despite having a common standard, every bank built differently, resulting in a fragmented environment. So if I'm a developer, you have to connect directly to each bank. Even within the same standard, there's significant variation, let alone if you want to connect to banks. Maybe you're a merchant that has customers in multiple countries. So let alone to connect to banks in other countries that follow other standards. So if you look at TPP frustration, uh, the difficulty to register and access, and the fragmentation having to wire uniquely to each bank, there are solutions for that. I think the private market will solve this. We don't need more regulation. We don't need a more common standard. I think we'll get there over time. Companies like Token provide one API to access all banks. So we've done that heavy lifting of registering with every bank and integrating to every bank, and we give you one API that's easy to embed within your application. 
Let's look at the second problem, which is friction and authentication. So a user has to apply through an application to either access data or initiate a payment. And it's the bank that has to authenticate the user. Problem is, is each bank used a different approach to authentication. And we've really had two problems, poor quality and lack of consistent experience. The poor quality is being solved by banks. Um, when we first went live with UK Open Banking version one, the authentication was 12 steps. You heard somebody earlier this morning say two thirds of the people that were building these thought it was a bad idea. And that was reflected in the experience. Um, but now banks are viewing, hey, this is a good opportunity. We need to make this usable. And HSBC, Monzo, and N26 have exceptional uh, authentication experiences that you really could see sit at a high volume, uh, low value uh, uh, point of sale transaction. So how do we solve the lack of consistency? So Sweden saw this. In Sweden, all the banks agreed to use a common authentication process, and it's called bank ID, underpinned by a common federated identity. And I think that's what we have to see happen in the UK and across Europe, is that there's an agreement of a common uh, authentication approach underpinned by an agreed upon a federated identity. Um, and for this, I think we need help from the regulator or from the banks to take this further uh, to solve. So the third is just restricted payment functionality. So in PSD2, the third party, by definition, cannot be or does not need to be under contract with the bank. So what's happened is the bank does not give a long-lived consent to a third party to access my, the, the user's account for payments. In data, I could grant a 90-day authentication that has to be reauthorized every 90 days. But in payment, that doesn't exist. So in payments, you're, list, you're limited to single immediate payments that have been initiated in real time by the user, so all transactions are user present. And this only addresses about 10% of the types of payments we make in our lives. So what's the solution here? I think the solution here, again, is not more regulation, is not more time for banks to build complex APIs. Uh, I do think the private market will solve this. And it's moving beyond compliance as the catalyst to embracing API-based banking um, through commercial APIs. And you'll hear talk of premium APIs or commercial APIs. It can be code running at a bank, or it can simply be a bilateral agreement between a third party and a bank. But premium APIs gives you, you heard Jamie say, the dirty little secret of open banking is it's a downgrade from screen scraping. So premium APIs allows you to get uh, access to more product types, uh, savings, lending, mortgages, pensions, investments. It allows you to get access to richer, uh, richer data packages where a bank can now make assertions about their customers. Or the bank can deliver an aggregated risk score. Or the bank can deliver enhanced payments functionality such as variable recurring payments. And this is important. So this is the roadmap to how you generate revenue from open banking. Banks have to service calls through the compliance APIs for free. And they cannot generate revenue from that. But compliance APIs are starting API-based banking. It's starting to make bank-based payments accessible as a cheaper form of payments in all the different applications. So the way you make money is go beyond offering greater functionality. So through a commercial API, it enables request to pay, which is very important. It allows the payee or the beneficiary to encode the request with all the data that they need to reconcile that transaction. It makes it easier for the payer to pay, makes it easier for the beneficiary to reconcile. Um, this allows <coughs> merchants to initiate payments or suppliers to initiate payments by holding a long-lived consent. So that means the world of subscription payments is now open to bank payments. Where Nespresso, if I've joined the Coffee of the Month Club, can hold a long-lived consent that I put rules around, so programmable consent, that Nespresso can debit my account on the 15th of every month between 30 and 50 pounds, up to a total of 600 pounds in any one year, um, and whatever types of rules you want to put around it. 
Um, so these are the types of capabilities that are monetizable by banks. It, these are the type of capabilities that make these a possibility. It, it will address 70 to 80% of the types of payments we make in our lives. So it can replace a card on file. So if you think all the places you have on your card on file, all those places of potential breach for your card information. So it's more secure, it settles more quickly, and significantly cheaper for the merchant. And I used Uber because this merchant initiated payment capability. I would give Uber a long-lived consent, subject to rules. I get out of the car and they charge my bank account, dramatically saving them money uh, and merchant fees. It can replace direct debits as a continuous payment authority. Direct debits are difficult to set up. Um, they take a few days to settle, but they carry an unlimited liability that the consumer can make a claim against that at any point in time. So a recurring bank transfer um, would settle faster, be easier to set up, and not carry this unlimited liability. It could also allow a bank to offer installment payments at the point of sale or through an e-commerce transaction. So the bank would do the on-settlement to the merchant and set up a recurring repayment from the consumer no matter who that a consumer banks with. This, I think, is going to become a very large use case. It will allow for autonomous actions on my money. So I can set up, so maybe through my primary bank, I can set up listeners on my other banks that any time I go below a level, they sweep in money to prevent an overdraft. Any time I go above a level, they sweep out money into a higher savings rate account. Or maybe I've instructed them to top up all my transactions across all my accounts to the next pound and, ro and round, uh, roll that into a savings pot. And lastly, again, moving from compliance APIs to commercial APIs, we will be seeing a bank payment sit at a point of sale, I believe, if not in the next year, in the year after that. It's already happening in Asia from Alipay, uh, which is a stored value account, but transferring from their account directly um, at point of sale. Um, so all these are future looking. All, this is how I believe banks will generate revenue. This is where I believe that we're, we're going as a future. And I'd also say we have no idea, to, uh, um, no idea what other use cases will become possible. And I'll just share two quick examples. Um, our founder was at MIT when they invented the internet. It was called ARPANET. And he wrote the first email program for the internet. They could only imagine two use cases. And, and that was email and file transfer. They couldn't even imagine all the ways the internet is being used today. Then in two, 1998, I was an internet banking company. 2008, I was at a mobile banking company. I had uh, the SVP of innovation at Wells Fargo in 2007 say to me, why would anybody want to check their balance on a phone? And then just two years later, any bank that didn't offer a mobile channel was at significant risk of losing customers for, for not having one. So what's going to be enabled five years from now when a bank is in every app? So what do we need to do to embrace this future? You know, banks need to realize it's not about controlling the relationship with the customer by walking into their, having them walk into your branch or having them sign into your digital channels. It's now about ecosystem banking. It's about, through APIs, meeting your customers in the applications they are using already. It's about figuring out through those APIs in the apps they use how to deliver premium packages and capabilities for what you could charge for. So I think that's then the path to revenue uh, for banks through open banking. So that was a quick summary on the current state of open banking, 140 million transactions. A lot of fragmentation in Europe, but Europe is going to get there. There are real use cases and data and payments that are, are happening. And I fully expect, you know, within the next one to three years, these barriers that I've mentioned to be addressed and for significant volumes of transactions for payments and access to data to be happening through banking APIs. So, so thank you very much. I'd be happy to take a question. Well, I promised you a master class, and thank you very much, no. Todd. Right, we have a time, I'm told, for a couple of questions. And if there are more, maybe you can catch up with Todd over lunch. So do we have some questions, please?
you got a mic or do I need to do my challenge, challenge Annika a bit? Hi, I was just wondering, uh, we're seeing that the UK brought in a good six month adjustment period to formally give everyone a notice, say, you should have had this in place in September, we're going to give you till March. But the AFM, MFSA, an awful lot of European bodies, they seem to be taking a blind eye approach where it's like we can't put all of you under lock and key, but we can't do anything. So what do you see happening in the rest of Europe? Because they haven't actually taken a definitive action about punishing. It's like they're all just waiting for everyone to slowly catch up enough that they can actually then enforce it. In the UK, we saw a grace period and um, half the banks missed the deadline, no penalties. Even up to three months ago, a, a very large UK bank, their success rates on payments were atrocious. Um, we're still not seeing any punitive action. Only now we're seeing the FCA start to come around and knock on the bank's doors and say, yeah, this, you're about to start to be penalized. So I think that was an appropriate grace period, and that's what we're seeing in Europe. Um, we are seeing many of our customers have told us they've, re they've received letters from the competent authority, um, often in the form of whether or not they've grant been granted an exemption from the fallback or not, um, but really exhorting them to what they need to get done, and then the banks have to present some form of corrective action plan to them. So I'd say it's, it's no penalties at this point in time. There's a grace period, which I think is, is great and the right thing. Um, but I am seeing the regulators in the UK and, and Europe be on top of this. Thank you. Very quickly, does anybody have any other questions before we wrap up? Todd, w thank you very much. Will everybody put their hands together for a huge um, appreciation? Thank you very much, Todd.